Um, the first uh, paper is by Josh and Bach, and it's uh, Seven Principles of Synthetic Intelligence. Okay, um, good morning. So, uh, my name is Josh Bach. Uh, I come from a computer science background. Initially, I uh, came from computer science and philosophy, and I'm mostly interested in looking at cognitive architectures. And when we do AGI, um, what we are basically up to is we are trying to understand the mind as a machine, something which already uh, Godfrey Bull and Leibniz has stated that if we want to look at the mind scientifically as an engineer or as a natural scientist, we uh, capture it as something like a mechanism that brings forth thoughts, experiences, and perception. And if we enlarge this, so to speak, if we can see it as a mechanism, something like a huge middle android, you can see the individual parts, how they work on each other. And this is, in a way, what we are trying to do. We are trying to understand the mind by constructing a working model of it, a formal theory that works in a computer very much the same way as physics does this, when they try to build a formal theory of uh, the regularities of the universe and see if it really works out in their simulations. However, this is not the whole story, because Leibniz himself didn't believe in that proposal. The whole quote is that perception and what depends on it, that is cognition, thinking, the mind, cannot be explained, because otherwise it would be a machine if it would be explained by natural sciences. And this is not really conceivable that we would have something like parts working upon each other which do bring forth cognition. And Leibniz did say this in the and many, many centuries ago, and it's still something which is very right when these days, Roger uh, Penrose basically says the same thing when he reminds us that understanding and perception can not be understood and simulated computationally. It has to be something which goes beyond computation, beyond formal theories, and he thinks that maybe it's quantum mechanics because for some reason he believes that quantum mechanics itself goes beyond what we can capture mathematically, so it's a mystery. And since consciousness, the mind, and so on, are mysteries themselves, maybe, hey, it's the same thing. <laughs> um, George Searle also goes in a similar direction when he um, points out that computers can only do syntax, they only can do symbol manipulation, and understanding is something which has to go intrinsically beyond symbol manipulation. So it cannot uh, come from mere simple manipulation, it has to come from something different, maybe from the intrinsic properties which only are inherent in biological neurons. And to put this more literally, the experience of the human being is not transferable into a machine. It's something which computers cannot have, and therefore computers cannot be creative. There are many, many more angles this uh, theme is variated in, and basically we have a cultural consensus in our Western society, more or less, that computers cannot and they should not, and maybe they cannot because they should not. And this winter of AI which we are witnessing is far from over. We are facing very strong cultural opposition, and when we are doing uh, general intelligence, general artificial intelligence as a subject, we pursue this, we all find ourselves in a similar position as somebody who does genetics and um, tries to build a genome to create a cell or an organism, and uh, the funding agency is populated by creationists. <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse in the world. Okay, but is this the only problem? Of course not. AGI uh, and uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence itself, has a lot of traps that it managed to fall into it on its own. And it starts with the fact that we are usually not really discussing what we are up to, what we are really trying to build, what our leading paradigms are, what kind of modules, techniques, mechanisms we want to implement. We have this general uh, direction artificial intelligence, and then we bend in many ways to uh, make it fit uh, on the tasks that are at hand. And we tend to diverge from the original question, and we tend not to formulate this question in a very precise manner. And 
But on the other hand, we fall into methodologism. That is, we develop a method, we find a method, and then we find the intricacies of these methods. We create communities, sub-communities, then we publish in these communities, and eventually these methods do not add up again. And uh, that way we do not get unified architectures. We do not get whole pictures, but rather we get individual models. And these mechanisms that we build tend to be ungrounded. They tend to be very often symbolic. They um, do not scale up. They confront with real-world variants. So we have too many of these approaches in AI. And on the other hand, we have too many of the dumb robotic approaches. We have um, lots and lots of interesting work with robots, which has a lot of value on its own, just as the symbolic processing has a value on its own, but not with respect, maybe, to get into the goal of general intelligence. And typically, for instance, we lack to integrate motivation with the representational structures in our AI programs. And also, and maybe most of all, AI suffers not only from a lack of funding, but from a lack of conviction. Maybe these go hand in hand. Okay, what can we learn from that? First of all, we should aim at whole functionalist architectures. Now, what do I mean by functionalism? What you can see here is something like an MRI image of a combustion engine. Huh. It's not an MRI image, it's an infrared image, but there's a big similarity, and the similarity doesn't stop with the colors. Um, if we look at this motion, we see lots and lots of very, very interesting things. Can you see up here to the right, there are the neural neurons. And um, we can see how they work, we can see if the thing goes at different speeds, how this image is going to change. We find very, very strong correlations. It's very descriptive. We also find that there are certain defects in the machine. If the combustion machine doesn't run the way it should do, we will find certain correlations which are very, very specific and uh, typical in this image. But the bad thing about this image is it doesn't give an explanation how it works, because it doesn't identify the functional parts. And what we do in cognitive science very often these days, especially in neuroscience, is that we mistake such an image for an explanation of how it works. But what we want to have is something like this. We want to have such an explanation. And of course, there's a lot of value in the FMI image. But only in the context of a functional explanation. We need to have a functional explanation to impose it upon the picture to the right and see um, what these individual parts, what we see in the description, actually mean. And in order to get there, we need to have a conceptual decomposition of the whole thing into its parts and entities and how they work upon each other. Second, second lesson would be that this question that we have, how to achieve general intelligence, define the method, not vice versa. It's not going to help us to have all these different methods and then try to accumulate them or to reunify the different areas of AI. If we go to an AI conference these days, we will have papers on description logics, on agent uh, technologies, um, on robotics, um, on game theory, um, on semantic web, and many, many different areas. And it's not as if we are someday going to merge all these things into artificial general intelligence. It's not going to happen. What we need is we have to define our methodology according to our question. It's pretty much the same thing as Ben Gerson just said. And we should, just as Ben Gerson said, aim for the big picture, not for narrow solutions. We need to have a conceptual decomposition. This is an example by Aaron Sloman. Um, and we should have an understanding of the individual parts which we have to integrate in such a system, reactive processes, interaction with the environment, deliberation, meta-management, how our persona comes about, what the theory of mind really is with respect to other agents, how memory works, how perception and action are interlinked, and so on. We should also aim for grounded systems. That is, systems which do interact with some environment. But on the other hand, we shouldn't get entangled in the philosophical, simple grounding problem. There is nothing uh, mystical in reality which we have to touch in order to gain intelligence. And we should also uh, remember that many, many embodied systems which we find on our planet, or the vast majority of them, is not capable of general intelligence. 
On the other hand, we have very, very intelligent beings like, say, Stephen Hawking, who is not the embodiment of the fridge, um, who um, is very intelligent. So embodiment is important, but the embodiment doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be in touch with the robotic environment. Uh, we need to have representations, though, which are adequate to represent the world and to tackle the combinatorial explosion that comes with that. We need to have representations which relate to how we interact with the world, not just abstract symbolic descriptions. And we should not wait for the rapture of robotic embodiment in order to get there. Robotic embodiment is very, very costly, not just because of the cost of robots, that has shrunk it down considerably, but in order to get the robot to do basic things, we are going to spend a lot, a lot of time and focus. Um, I've done, um, for instance, robotic soccer for a few years myself, and I've learned that if we do this uh, robotic soccer, we have a very close environment with a limited number of representations uh, which we encounter. And it's not as if we just arrive there and we just conquer the field and then uh, the task was solved in the same way as chess was solved. It's a very interesting task in its own right because we have a discrete environment with many unforeseen features and so on. But eventually, this is probably not going to end up in general intelligence, but in some kind of an insectoid solution which is very good at playing robotic soccer. And the environment which we have there is considerably less complex than many virtual environments I've been playing with. So, the yeah, big challenge which we have here is to find benchmark problems for AI. We want to have benchmark problems which need to be AI hard, which require intelligence in order to solve them, and still they should be incrementally uh, solved. And it's a very difficult task, just looking for benchmark problems. Um, we should also aim for autonomous systems. Intelligence is not something which is related to problem solving. It's about finding the goals in the first place, finding the problems in the first place. Intelligence is not the answer to some resource allocation problem, rather it's a very complex control task. And we are organisms in the world which poses many, many different demands. And the, uh, how to satisfy these, these demands is not specified in the moment we are born, but rather it emerges later in the way our interaction with the environment shapes us. And from this arise uh, goals and motives, and this uh, shapes the way our cognition works, the things which are relevant, the things which are uh, relevant in our own mental representations, and so on. So we need to integrate these mechanisms into our AI systems, and this is something which I strongly believe. And also, I don't think that intelligence is something which will appear in our system by some mystical emergence process. Just if we amass enough computational complexity, then suddenly pops up, uh, some kind of intelligence pops up, and then it tries to um, achieve world dominance and uh, tries uh, to um, um, wage a war against mankind, or at least um, capture some women on its own and do all these things <laughs> to find its hypotheses. These are things which probably have to be built into the system, at least at some level. We have to identify the components which are responsible for things like personhood, uh, social relationships, for phenomenal experience, or what we define as being conscious. And we have to take all these things and decompose them. And then, at some level, we have to realize them in the system. Okay, uh, our own group has taken or tried to take these lessons and come up with a relatively simple start for an architecture in the course of the past seven years, which we call MicroPsy. It's based on a theory uh, by a German um, psychologist, um, David Dietrich Jörner. The theory itself is called Psy theory, so we call this because it embodies a subset of the goals of the theory MicroPsy. And it uses a unified neuro symbolic representation, it integrates motivation in this uh, system, and um, it creates autonomous agents which navigate um, our lab floor or which navigate virtual environments uh, in order to pursue their goals. And uh, the whole system is, um, consists out of a um, neural network simulator for low level perception, which is integrated with um, it's a special case in the more general semantic natural formalism, which is in which you can define agents and run them. And um, then we have component which gives us multi-agent systems, so we can many, uh, have many agents interact, have them interact, and 
confront them with environmental tasks with the hope which they can build representations and learn. And we have modules so we can implement the same structures and use the same structures on robots. The whole thing is built into a big architecture that is defined by the size theory more or less. And this theory asks what are really the components of cognition, what means for it for something for something to be um, human level intelligent or beyond that or intelligent per se, what modules do we need? Um, the same is based on a unified mode of newer symbolic representations, um, which work by spreading activation and are hierarchical, and on the lowest level are connected to sensors and actuators, and thereby um, concepts can encode um, the structure or relatives and patterns which are represented by the environment, and thereby acquire their meaning, their relationships with respect to, uh, to the environment. And um, the individual parts are, for instance, threshold elements or more complex nodes. And the whole thing is integrated with this um, motivational system, which uh, learns by different kinds of pleasure and displeasure, and has um, neural learning and reinforcement learning methods. And it works by starting out with a basic set of predefined demands that the system has. And each of these demands uh, corresponds to a drive to satisfy this demand. So the goals of the system are not predefined, but the demands of the system are given by the inherent structure of the system very much as our demands are given by our biological makeup. And these are, of course, physiological demands for uh, nutrition and for physical integrity, for instance. Then we have social demands. Uh, these shape our interaction with others and make us be interested in others as agents, not, not as objects and make us conform to social norms, or also with respect to our own conceptualization of our own personality and uh, ourselves as a being. And we have cognitive demands, and these cognitive demands are towards the desire for the reduction of uncertainty, and another one to be competent in um, solving problems in general. And these shape the exploration of the environment, um, not only of the physical environment, but also of our internal cognitive environment. And together, they create a dynamic system which constantly changes its goals in order to build more complex representations of environments to solve the tasks better and to maintain survival of the individual. And if we look at an example of representation in that system, we have hierarchical representations. Um, the storage relate directly to the patterns of the environment, build a regular representations over them, and use others as symbols to um, get access to them when you need them, and, um, for instance, in communicative situations. And these are embedded in situational descriptions of the environment which are uh, acquired through learning, and they gain their relevance by the connection to the individual demands of the system, for instance, by in order, in this given example, um, we might be afraid of dogs because um, we have been bitten once by one, and on the other hand, we might be um, uh, liking dogs because they are able to satisfy our demand for affiliation. And this together creates meaningful representations of the environment, which help us in a different context to only get those representations which um, are uh, relevant in order to achieve the goal and uh, have the potential to live with cognitive. Uh, complexity explosion, which you normally would have if you just have an arbitrary, non-relevant smart representation of the environment. So that's